Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. As many of you know, Luke and I were on vacation last week and are happy to report that we're now back, rested, and ready to bring you some new true crime stories. We also want to thank everyone who sent kind messages of support and well wishes on our week off. If we didn't get a chance to respond to your message, just know that we saw it and are extremely grateful. On that note, to answer the top two questions we got last week, no, we weren't on vacation together, and in terms of where we were, I won't speak for Luke, but I myself managed to get out and spend a week in Ontario's cottage country. If you're from Canada, you already know that trips to the cottage are sort of the quintessential summer experience for many of us, and this week certainly did not disappoint. Since cottage country was already at the forefront of our minds, we decided to make that the theme of this week's series, and we'll be bringing you two chilling stories that took place in Ontario's famous Muskoka region. Before we get to the videos, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. With that out of the way, here are two eerie cases that happened in Canadian cottage country. By the spring of 2007, it was an open secret that the relationship between 29-year-old Samantha Collins and her 32-year-old boyfriend, Ian Borbley, was not a good one. Though the couple had originally moved to the town of Bracebridge, Ontario to escape their problems, things had only gotten worse in the years since. However, no one imagined that it would be here, in the heart of the Muskoka region, that the tumultuous relationship would end with a horrifying discovery. Ian and Samantha met at a party held by mutual friends in Toronto in 2003. By all accounts, it seemed that they had nothing in common. Ian was the son of two middle-class parents from Bracebridge, a small-town kid who had moved to the city to become a personal trainer. Samantha, on the other hand, had been raised by a single mother in Mississauga. She had gotten pregnant in high school, dropped out, and put the baby up for adoption. After that, she supported herself by selling drugs and working as a stripper at a club near Pearson Airport. Regardless, Ian and Samantha were instantly attracted to each other and jumped into a relationship right away. After spending just a single night together, Ian invited Samantha to move in with him, and she accepted. However, it didn't take long for cracks to appear in their relationship. The two seemed to amplify each other's excesses, and they quickly spiraled into a pattern of constant financial problems brought on largely by their rampant drug use. With no money for rent, Ian eventually turned to stealing from a construction firm near the fence building company where he worked part-time. He was caught and charged with possession of stolen property. Deciding that the best course of action was to skip Ian's court appearance, it was then that he and Samantha packed up their belongings and fled to Bracebridge to start over. For a time, this seemed to work. The pair were able to financially recover by living rent-free in Ian's parents' house, and despite an arrest warrant back in Toronto, police were either unwilling or unable to track him down. Though Ian's parents did not like Samantha, believing she was a bad influence on their son, the couple was allowed to stay with them until they found a place on their own in Bracebridge. During this time, Samantha got pregnant, and she and Ian eventually moved out sometime after the birth of their son in May of 2004. However, problems soon emerged once again. Ian worked construction jobs, but the couple still struggled financially, as well as to care for their young child. This led to frequent loud and violent altercations between Ian and Samantha, during which the police were called multiple times. On one occasion, Samantha was arrested for punching Ian, and other times she threw a plate of spaghetti at his head. The fighting reportedly got so bad that their landlord paid them nearly $1,000 to move out of their apartment. Despite holding down steady jobs, Ian and Samantha were kicked out of their next place for not paying rent, settling for a third time in a small bungalow near the Muskoka River. Ian had taken a job working for a man named Jeremy Kreese fixing up old cottages, and Samantha was working as a waitress at a local restaurant. Still, it didn't take long for them to fall behind on their rent once again. Determined not to move back in with Ian's parents, Samantha went to counseling for her drug addiction. However, it was clear that she was done with Ian as well. During this time, she had numerous affairs and began making plans to leave. She wanted to take their son with her as well. Near the end of March in 2007, she told her doctor she was leaving town and asked her addiction counselor for a letter explaining the progress she had made in the program. She presumably planned to use this to apply for sole custody of their son. Then came the morning of March 22nd. While Ian took their son to daycare, Samantha stayed behind, making a series of phone calls. One of these calls was to the daycare, informing them that they shouldn't let Ian's parents pick up her son that afternoon. 
At 9.30 a.m., Ian and Samantha were scheduled to appear at a rent tribunal to discuss their possible eviction. Neither of them showed up. That afternoon, Ian picked up his son from daycare, but there was no sign of Samantha anywhere. From that point on, she would never be seen again. Despite the fact that the mother of his child was gone, Ian didn't seem worried. He never reported her missing and began to tell numerous different stories about what had happened to her. He told his parents that Samantha had moved back to Toronto, leaving only a single note that said, F you, I'm out of here. To others, Ian said that Samantha had gone to Oshawa, Hamilton, or Windsor. Because Samantha was estranged from most of her family, no one else was really looking for her either. The exception was her sister Nicole, who became concerned after a couple of years passed with no contact from Samantha. She began a search on Facebook and eventually made contact with Ian Borbley in the spring of 2009. He gave Nicole his number, but was evasive for some time afterwards, finally telling her that Samantha had gone south and wasn't coming home. It wasn't until 2010 that the horrifying truth would be revealed. Over the Victoria Day weekend in May, a Toronto immunologist named Peter Vadas discovered a mysterious wooden crate in the crawlspace of his cottage on Wood Lake. The crate was a six-feet cube hidden behind a single sheet of plywood and didn't look as if it had been there long. Vadas was confused about why it was there but not overly concerned and forgot about it for more than a month before he finally asked his groundskeeper about it. The groundskeeper said that he didn't know what it was and finally on July 5th went into the crawl space and pried the crate open with a crowbar. He was immediately met by the stench of rotting meat and called police. When investigators opened the rest of the crate, they discovered four plastic drywall buckets. The buckets were wrapped in garbage bags and the gaps between them were filled with spray foam insulation. Inside were the dismembered remains of a woman. It didn't take long to identify the woman as Samantha Collins. Thanks to her prior arrests, police had her fingerprints and descriptions of her tattoos on file, which were matched to the remains. An autopsy revealed that she had died from several blows to the head from a blunt object that had fractured her skull. Given the nature of Samantha's relationship with Ian Borbley, investigators immediately narrowed in on him as the prime suspect, spending the next 10 months conducting an investigation. It turned out that Borbley could easily be connected to the Wood Lake property where the remains had been found. He and his former employer, Jeremy Kreese, had done a year and a half long renovation job at the cottage that began in the fall of 2007, just a few months after Samantha had disappeared. During that time, investigators theorized that he had stolen scraps of lumber and plywood to construct the wooden crate, which he had then held onto until he could find a more permanent place for the remains. In the spring of 2010, he had again been hired by the owner, Peter Vadas, to open the cottage for the long weekend, and it was then that police believed he moved the crate into the crawl space. From there, investigators constructed a detailed timeline of the events they believe had occurred leading up to Samantha's disappearance. Based on Samantha's phone records, investigators theorized that Ian had come home sometime during the phone call she was making on the morning of their rent tribunal. Discovering that she planned to leave him and take their son, Ian had flown into a rage and had beaten Samantha to death. It was speculated that his absence at the rent tribunal that morning was due to the several hours it took to clean up the crime scene. Police believed that the following day, Ian had traveled to Home Depot where he had purchased the four buckets to hide the remains. He then drove to a job site that he knew would be abandoned and cut Samantha's body into pieces with a reciprocating saw. From there, it was believed that Ian had constructed the grisly wooden crate, which he proceeded to move around for the next three years before finally attempting to hide it in the crawl space of the cottage on Wood Lake. Though much of the box's whereabouts prior to this time remained unaccounted for, police were able to determine that it had likely spent some time in a 15 by 10 foot storage unit that had been rented by a friend of Ian's named Mark Hill. Hill agreed to give Ian possession of the storage unit in 2007, and shortly after Ian moved a number of items and personal belongings in. Though police could find no physical evidence tying Ian Borbley to Samantha's murder, there were other things that appeared incriminating. Though Ian claimed that Samantha had taken off and cleaned out her bank account, he had remained in possession of a suspicious number of her personal items, including her clothes, cell phone, and even her debit card. He had sold Samantha's clothes to settle a drug debt and continued to use her cell phone until the phone company canceled the account. By far the most incriminating evidence, however, was the activity related to Samantha's debit card and bank account. Not only had Ian continued to deposit the disability checks she received into her account, he had used the debit card to make several large purchases, including a barbecue, a lawnmower, and an expensive dinner. Ian Borbley was arrested in May of 2011, and 18 months later, the case went to trial. During the proceedings, his lawyers argued that all of the evidence against him was circumstantial, and then there were significant holes in the timeline in the prosecution's theory of the case. 
They also presented Ian's former boss, Jeremy Kreese, as a potential suspect, arguing that he could have been the killer since he had access to the same construction sites. Ultimately, the jury was unconvinced by these arguments, and in May of 2013, Ian Borbley was convicted of second-degree murder and indignity to human remains and was sentenced to life in prison. Borbley appealed his conviction on multiple grounds, insisting that manslaughter should have been a possible verdict and that the judge had made errors about the admissibility of evidence at trial. The appeal spent multiple years working its way through the justice system until it reached the highest court of Ontario, which rejected the appeal in January of 2021. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.